It is such a blessing to be back. Thank you so much for your prayers these uh, past two weeks. Uh, we were in Mexico for a week, and I'm going to be sharing some things that uh, went on there. And then uh, we spent a couple of days in El Paso with our good uh, friend and brother, uh, pastor at Horizon Christian Fellowship. Last Sunday, I was, uh, I was ministering there and teaching there. And uh, uh, Billy and Sarah McNair's parent and, and Hannah's parents uh, were here when we were there. I was so looking forward to seeing them, and then I found out, no, they were here while we were over there, and, but it was a blessing to know that they were here. It, that's the church that they attend. And Pastor Clift, I've known him for 18 years, and they have been just a tremendous blessing, an integral part of what God has been doing in Mexico. And then uh, we went to a family reunion, Bear Lake, with uh, 14 grandchildren and uh, 13 kids and spouses. And there were 27 of us in this one big house. And that was, uh, there were some crazy times there. And, uh, but it was a, a very, very good time. We played a Hunger Games water balloon fight. And um, they made it up and they said, are you going to play dad? And I said, yeah, man, I'm in, totally. So I am thinking, okay, what's my strategy here? And there was a big, big uh, barrel full of water balloons, and, and, and they were on, on one, two, three, go. You had to go, and you get, and if you got hit, you were out. And so uh, I strategized. I thought, okay, I'm going to let everybody go. I tried to shove my son-in-law over first before, right at three, I tried to shove him over. That didn't work. So I ran over to the side, and I let them all go in and start bombarding each other and then I strategized very carefully I waited till they were out of balloons in their hands and then I was going in to swoop up a couple of balloons take out a couple of people and quite possibly win didn't work out that way I was running downhill momentum going I missed the balloons went down fell to the ground rolled over somebody nailed me with a water balloon and that was the end of my experience, and I'm probably still a little out of whack because of that. But I participated. So thank you for your prayers. Who knows, I could have, you know, been wounded for life or something if you hadn't have been uh, praying for us. So I appreciate that. And then we got back on, let's see, Thursday, and then uh, drove to Lake Chelan for Corey and Krista Peterson's wedding. They got married uh, last night. And uh, we left the reception in Lake Chelan about 9.30, and God bless my daughter Whitney, who drove while I was passed out in the, in the, in this. I, I kept hearing these tunes that she'd be singing to, and then, and then next thing I know, we were in Puyallup, and it was a, it was a good thing. So I'm a little bit tired, a little bit giddy, as you can probably already tell, uh, but very excited about what God is doing. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that our hearts would be open specifically to the things that you uh, want to say to us. And Lord, we want to thank you. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the prayers of these dear saints uh, to lift the team up, to lift our family up. And I thank you, Lord, for the faithful servants that... Uh, that we're here, that, uh, Lord, we're grateful that as a church we can continue to have church. And, and, Lord, it doesn't revolve around any one person, oh, Lord. This is, it's your church. It belongs to you. And we want to take all of our direction and our leading from you, oh, Lord. And so thank you, Lord, just for answered prayer. We pray that our hearts would be open, that our eyes would be open that our ears would be open to the things that you want to speak to us about being the church, about learning to live in the reality of Jesus, what it means to be followers of Christ. Lord, I thank you that you stirred our hearts to pray congregationally, to pray together. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to lead us. We praise you and thank you for the work you're doing in our midst. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to do it and that you would find us uh, humbly submitted to your authority and your majesty and your glory and your power. In Jesus' name, we pray that you would put a hedge of protection around this place, that your will would be accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Amen. Well, this morning I want to take some time and I want to share about our trip to Mexico. And in so doing, I, I pray that you would be greatly encouraged in the role that you have played. Now, how many here have been to Bashiniva, Mexico before on a, hold your, hold your hand up nice and high, take a look around and you can kind of see who's been. Okay, uh, and how many of you have not? Let's see how many of you have, you have not. Okay, there we go. So there's a lot of you that haven't. And my prayer would be that you would be so encouraged uh, and at what you see that you might seek to to be more involved But having said that let me tell you you have been involved You may say well, I've never gone there. Listen you've prayed You've agreed in prayer as we've been praying you have financially supported the work that has gone there uh, you've listened and been moved as, as people have shared in years past, as Pastor Jason has shared about the orphanage, which I'll share a little bit more here in just a moment. So you have been involved at so many different levels. And there is so much that I could say uh, about what God has done there uh, that we could literally spend hours here. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that to you today, but I do want to sh highlight a few things. And, the, and, and what I want to do is I want to start by telling, uh, inviting the people who, who, who went on that trip with us. Uh, uh, there's uh, Myron and Liz uh, Sorgen Fry, my wife Jenny, Gary Liljenberg, uh, then also Glenn Sorgen Fry. He's actually from Davenport, uh, Iowa, and so he's obviously not going to be here to share. I wish he was. Uh, because, boy, what a delight it was getting to know him. He's a lot nicer than Myron. I, I was kind of surprised <laughs> with that because Myron's a nice guy. But Glenn, pff, even nicer, plus he's a chiropractor. So not only is he nice, he adjusts you while being nice. It was a, it was a, a great experience. So I'm going to have them come up and share, and I want you to listen to how the Lord impacted them. Then we're going to take a little step back in time for just a brief minute. And what I want you to, to hear, what I want you to understand, is how God has opened up a unique opportunity for our church to be involved in not only impacting a town and a community, but I believe is impacting uh, a country, the country of, of Mexico. And so with that, I'm going to invite uh, just whoever wants to come up first to share, they're gonna share, I've asked them to share for just a few minutes with you of, of how were they touched, what impacted them most uh, in, their, in their trip. So let's have uh, Myron come up and then Liz, and then we'll have uh, Jenny and then Gary. Sorry. No, you're good. Oops. Thank you. <laughs> All right. It's a good thing the Lord's apprehended Pastor Ron's life. I mean, I mean the stories get a little wild sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so it's a good thing the Lord's leading him. Um, we would, uh, I, I don't even know where to begin to start, but uh, I just want to, um, first of all, just let you know how appreciative I am of your prayers for Mexico, um, just personally and and uh, really seeing the work that's down there and the work that is done. Um, it's just amazing the things that are going on down there. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, when we went down there, the first day was Sunday, and we started out the day in prayer with um, some brothers from um, uh, Santa Fe, the church, uh, Pastor Pete's church in Santa Fe, and uh, it was a great time. There was a little boy there that was about this tall, and he prayed his little heart out, and I don't know what he said, but I know one thing. He was praying. He was praying from his heart because he was, he was deep into it. And the Lord was doing some mighty, mighty things. We, um, it was the church's 10-year um, celebration that Sunday. We got to hear uh, Pastor Luis's heart and Pastor Pete's heart and then Pastor Ron's heart that day about what has gone on in the past down in Mexico. And it was just really good to hear from the roots of everything that was going on. Pastor Ron's going to go into that in more detail later, so I'll save that for him. But then after the service, we got to fellowship and have some lamb barbacoa, and it was really good, and our fellowship was good. 
And then, um, and then um, we, uh, the next day we spent, uh, most of the rest of the week we spent at the children's home. It is a beautiful, beautiful place. It is, uh, it is just a blessing to see what the Lord has built up down there. Um, it is very nice. We got to stay. I would say in Mexico we were, we were living high because it was, we were, we were well taken care of. We had um, Becky and Irima. It was a couple young gals that were cooking for us, and uh, we got to help them in the kitchen. And, and um, they, they just blessed us with taking care of all the food needs and things like that. And we got to do some projects down there. And, um, but the most important thing was we got to meet the little orphans. We got to meet... Um, Erasmo, he's, a, he's, he's about 13, and he's a strong, strong young man who, um, he's a little pistol, but he is, uh, he's fun to be around, and, and I, I'm just looking forward to see how the Lord changes his heart and works on him. And then we got to meet uh, Jorge and Sandra, a brother and sister, and uh, uh, Sandra's just the sweetest thing. She really liked my brother Glenn, of course, everybody did, right? That's wrong. And, uh, and she, she was... Uh, uh, she was just horsing around with him, playing around with him. It reminded me of, he, of, of him with his own daughter. It was pretty cool. And then Luis. Luis is a, 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 he's a little challenged, mentally challenged a little bit. And he, he, <laughs> he was so random. I mean, he's just a random guy. And, he, and uh, uh, he, what he'll do is he'll, he'll give you a hug and stuff. And he'll come behind you, but he'll come up behind you and give you a little swat. And uh, it just catches, like, all the girls are just, like, looking behind him, thinking, that, is it Luis coming behind him because he's going to come up behind me and hit me? And, uh, but he, he just does, I mean, he's not mean in doing it. He's just doing it. But I guess he's come a long ways from um, just being at the orphanage. And um, Jackie and Jason, they were made for being down there. I'm telling you, the Lord has just worked in their lives. And they just love on those kids. And uh, the kids adore them. And they just, they just love to... Uh, um, talk, you know, just go up and see Jackie and Jason, and, and uh, their Spanish is getting better, and, and they're working with them on their homework, and um, uh, just in, in, in living life, and, and what it's like to live life with uh, them as their parents, so they may have uh, uh, just came down there with the aunt too, but they have five kids now, and <laughs> their family's growing quick, and uh, it is, it, it was a, just a really a blessed time, um, the Lord uses everybody down there. Uh, it, it's one work. I mean, it's not separated from the church. The people from the church come out and they work in the orphanage, and, and the orphanage goes to church at that church, and they're growing up in the ways of the Lord. So it's really just a blessing. Um, God's doing this mighty work through all of us here as well, as Pastor Ron spoke to you, and I just want to encourage you in that. So keep doing that. Um, Keep, keep praying for Jackie and Jason and the things that the Lord is doing through them and growing them. And uh, pray, pray, for the, pray for the kids in Mexico to grow up and to be able to go out in their community and uh, just be a light to them. We don't want to Americanize them. We want them to, to grow up in their culture and be uh, just uh, sharers of the gospel to go out and, and share with the, the country there. My, my brother, I didn't know what it was going to be like going on a missions trip with my brother, but he was like the Pipe Piper of Mexico. He started working, he started doing, uh, adjusting people, and they, were, they just started lining up for him and, and going to see him, because one would tell another one. But the funniest thing was Luis, would, uh, Luis was watching their face when, when he would crack their neck, and they'd just get this expression, and Luis was dying laughing about it. <laughs> he was getting well entertained. Well, my brother was working on these guys. So um, I have a, a verse that the Lord uh, spoke to my heart. And um, I just wanted to share it with you guys that you would pray this way for the people of Mexico. As Paul prayed for the church of Thessalonica. In First Thessalonica um, chapter 2 through 5, it says, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So just pray, pray um, 
for them down there. Uh, as we just prayed, you guys broke my heart this morning when you're praying. When you're praying for those that you know, <clears throat> it is the Lord working through this church to do these things. And we don't do anything. I thought I was going to go down to Mexico to encourage that church. I don't know what I did for them, but I can tell you they changed my heart. And uh, it's a good thing. So I'll hand it over to my wife. <laughs> Hopefully I don't make her cry. <laughs> Yeah, when your husband cries, you cry too. Um, I had the privilege of being able to share what the Lord was speaking to my heart to the ladies. Um, they had a women's event the Sunday night. We were there. And the Lord put on my heart, uh, Philippians 2.3, which says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem others better than yourself. And um, what really spoke to me was, in loneliness of mind, we have to humble ourselves in order to esteem someone above ourselves. And um, so the Lord put that on my heart to share with the ladies. And um, I asked them the question, you know, what would our church be like if everyone obeyed this verse? And the Lord has been really working in my heart even after um, going to Mexico with this verse. And, and uh, he... Uh, Continued. Uh, Jenny handed me a book that we would be studying on the plane, and the, the title of it was Humility by Andrew Murray. So I knew the Lord was uh, really speaking to me in a mighty way. And then we had a devotional, which we were reading through the Bible in a year. It was Acts 3. And when Peter and John uh, healed the lame man, all the people were astounded and were looking at them as if they had done this mighty work. But Peter rebuked them and said, no, this is what God has done. Don't look at us, but look at the Lord. And, um, and then uh, celebrating the 10-year anniversary, uh, it was just a glorious time because it was me experiencing their culture for the first time um, and uh, just how Pastor Luis gave all the glory for just years and years of what the Lord has been doing down there. And then what the Lord is doing down there. I mean, you could just see God's glory in the people and in the work, in the orphanage, in the children. Little Sandra got up and they all sang uh, worship in the service. And she just lit up. She was, it was amazing. It's hard to explain how happy she was. And um, Pastor Ron said, he said when we were leaving, he goes, I'm surprised you didn't get all teary up. And and I just thought, why would I? The kids are so well taken care of. They're so happy. Glenn said that his favorite thing was hearing the kids laugh so much. They're just happy. Um, they're so well taken care of. They have beautiful bedrooms with uh, homemade quilts on them and nice beds and great food. The food is fantastic down there. If you love Mexican food, it's the best. And uh, the orphanage is just... It's awesome. They have fresh well water, and um, it's just amazing. It's amazing what God is doing. And um, just to go down, and I was telling Myron on a walk that we were on, I said, wow, to be in the reality of what we've been praying for for so long, to see the building um, in person, to see the kids, to meet the kids, and to see Jackie and Jason love on those kids, and they just... And the church, the church people are loving on the kids just as much and supporting them. The women come for a Bible study on Tuesday mornings, and then they disperse and clean the whole building, windows and all. And then they break bread together. Then they, you know, eat a meal together, and it's just a sweet time. And um, I just think it's amazing how the women accept us when we come um, from the States and uh, how they just love on us and uh, I offended a few ladies because I was doing too many dishes and mopping the floor and they took the mop from me and kicked me out of the kitchen and but and they're hard workers um, I just love the people there so that was what the Lord spoke to me
Liz and I decided we'd make a pact and we'd kiss each other now. Because <laughs> that's how, that's the greeting there. Um, for me, the, I think um, I have a memory of the last day that we were there. Kim and Luis um, and Ron and I, it was late at night and we drove in from the orphanage into Pashinova to pick up some empanadas from Luis's sister, Armida, and we were driving back and we noticed a truck pulled over by the side of the road and um, two, which had two men in it, they were married, we found out, and there were two little girls standing in front of their house, I'll try and get through this, <laughs> two little girls standing in front of their house talking to these two married men and um, and Luis pulled over and Kim called one of the little girls over. She was seven and her older sister was 12 and Kim started talking to them and said, where's your mom? And said she's at work. She was a single mom and and then Kim very sternly told them they needed to go in the house and shut the door and not open that door for anyone. And, and so we were kind of listening. They were speaking in Spanish to the girls, but we just asked what was going on. And these two men um, were predators and trying to <laughs> get these girls to have sex with them. And um, it was such a sobering reminder of the darkness of the world. And then Kim told me that um, uh, the week before, the mom had actually been seen in the truck with the guys, with her 12-year-old. And um, so I just thought, Lord, what an end to this missions trip to see that. And I didn't sleep much that night. and. Um, just the sadness of darkness. And the Lord made a couple things really clear to me. One, I'm so nervous, <laughs> sorry. One is that um, there's an enemy of our souls out there who really wants to devour us, um, wants to take our kids from us. And, um, and the second thing was that the orphanage and the church they're the beacon in that town. They are the light. And there is no other light in that town. And it's such a privilege to be a part of that it, for us. Um, even if you've never been or even if you never go, it's, um, it's just an amazing blessing for us to be able to participate in what's going on down there. And those two little girls had been at the church the night before helping me in the kitchen. And, and I just thought, gosh, Lord, just save them. Save them. And um, that verse comes to mind. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly um, with our God. And there's darkness everywhere. There's darkness here. And the Lord made it very clear to me that I'm to be a light um, in this place, that um, I am to share Jesus. It isn't just doing good things or good works. It's to um, show people the hope of eternity. So that's me. Well, I don't know what more I can add to what has already been said, but uh, this has been, uh, I don't know how many trips I've been down there. Uh, I th it was 2004, I think, the first trip that I made down. Uh, the church wasn't there. There was just bare grounds. We prayed over, over that uh, ground. And uh, just to see what God has accomplished through you guys through our prayers and you know um, in my wildest dreams I would have never dreamed that what is going on down there would would ever have taken place uh, it's just an experience that 
uh, you can never uh, forget, never, it's just a, a blessing to, to go down. Uh, this trip down was uh, a little more difficult for me and I don't know why. Uh, uh, it just was a, a difficult trip for me. And, uh, but in all in all, I, I, the, the Lord was strong and he showed what, uh, what was going on there. And um, one of the things that uh, really impacted me is um, one, of the, one night, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know, I think there was, I don't know how many guys, do you guys remember how many went over? 20 some guys went over anyway. Sergio, uh, one of the members of the church down there uh, is leading, leading a Bible study in another community that's uh, oh, probably 20 miles away. And uh, we went over and we prayed over uh, some ground that they're thinking about uh, having the Lord uh, direct them what they want to do with that. And here again, uh, we go, the Lord is starting something. And, you know, even though the darkness is there and, and, and that what little light is there is so strong and so uh, 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 great that, you know, it, it's just hard to believe what what's going on there and it's just so thankful that we that we have the opportunity to to go down if any of you ever have the opportunity to go um, it's just such a blessing and and uh, I can't you know it's just it's just God's work and joy of being there and again it's just uh, thank you for your prayers and your current and anyway Amen, man. Forgot about some of those things that that happened. There was there was so much. I I love uh, you know known Gary. Gary, as he said, he was with us on that first trip. And Gary's one of those mild spoken, just kind of mild mannered guys. He just he's taken it all in, and he doesn't say a whole lot. And uh, uh, been involved in home fellowships with him over the years. If they've come to the church gosh, I think probably 11 years or so. And, uh, and I, I, I've seen Gary tear up and, and cry probably, I don't know, maybe half a dozen times or so in all those years, eight times maybe. And uh, probably six of those times have been uh, just how God has moved his heart in just the work uh, in Mexico. I, I love what God is doing uh, in our church, um, it, it's been a challenging years in many er, uh, year in many respects. Uh, but uh, what cannot be denied is what what God is doing, and it's always going to be challenging. Why? Because the Lord has knuckleheads like us to deal with. I mean, that, myself included in that list. I mean, it's always uh, going to be challenging. And uh, but whenever I find myself getting impatient with with others or uh, with people or with family members who, uh, you know, in a family reunion, uh, I'm reminded of how the Lord puts up with us and how he uses us in spite of us. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity the Lord's given us. Just a very, very quick and brief um, uh, history. That work actually started, uh, I, m m most of you know this already, but there are many people here who are new who haven't heard this. That work actually started in 1996 uh, when I was a youth pastor and uh, took six leaders <clears throat> and 13 kids to Bashiniva. Uh, my brother-in-law, Luis, my sister did not know the Lord at that time. <clears throat> they were going to translate uh, for me. And uh, the Lord had put it on, on my heart to, to take a team of people there that would come alongside an existing work rather than going in where an American agency had come in and started a work and then we were just coming alongside that American agency. And to God be the glory, uh, I, I can take no credit for that because I, I didn't, I'd never even been on a missions trip. But I'm so grateful that the Lord put it on my heart that we were obedient to that. We came alongside another church 
uh, there. It was actually a childhood friend of Luis who grew up in that area. It was a little bit more of a Pentecostal church, and uh, Luis translated for me, and, and both Luis and my sister got saved on that, that trip. Uh, I visited off and on for a couple more times over the next uh, eight years. I didn't end up uh, uh, leaving that church uh, after, uh, shortly after that missions trip uh, and was, was uh, involved in ministry in another church. Uh, but then in 2004, about three years after we planted this church, uh, and one of the individuals, uh, actually two of the individuals that were on that first trip in 1996, one of them was uh, Anna James, who was singing up here uh, this morning. We were kind of reminiscing about that. Uh, she, she came with us, and another one was uh, my son, my middle son, Jason, who was 16 year old, years old at the time. And uh, so in 2004, 18 of us, nine adults and nine young people went on that church. Pastor Charles Gillespie, our high school pastor, he was at that, uh, on that trip. Gary was on that trip. Emily Bethune, who is now married to Ben Spector, and, and uh, so is now Emily Spector, she was on that trip as well. Uh, and she's now a full-time missionary, speaks uh, uh, practically fluent Croatian. And, uh, and the Lord used that trip significantly to prepare her for the mission field. If I would have had to have listed on that trip who would be the least likely to be a missionary, there's a good chance it would have been her. Uh, she just did not fare too well that first time. But, but I'll tell you what, the wheels were turning in her mind and in her heart as she was playing with those little kids during the VBS uh, that we were doing. And it was on that trip 10 years ago that God allowed us to be a part of, uh, with some other, uh, with what God had put on Luis's heart uh, to care for the children. And he was beginning to stir and indicate that he was called, he was to be a pastor. And the Lord really confirmed that on our trip there. And we were able to purchase the land um, that the church uh, was built on for $450. Uh, and we just saw the beginning of a, of a tremendous uh, work of God. To him be the glory. I've truly lost count of how many trips we've taken since then. Uh, at least one, generally uh, two trips per year, in some years as many as three, and there may have even been one year in there where there was, where there was four or close to that. And those trips included uh, vacation Bible schools. What's very exciting is in the beginning, we came alongside them. Uh, the church, when it first started, there was primarily um, there was primarily women, very few men. The men would be sitting out in their trucks or on their horses. They wouldn't come in. And now there is a lot of men that come to the church. It used to be that we would come in and do everything, and now we come in and participate with what they're doing. And that is a very exciting and a very profound thing that we have watched uh, God do. The church is packed. Uh, there's there's uh, standing room only in the church on Sunday. And even on Wednesday, there were many, many uh, people who were there in this little town of about 25 a hundred or so people. Uh, we had the opportunity to add a second story to the Vargas's home in our early trips and then building a man and a woman's dorm uh, next to the church, uh, helping with the construction of a sewing room for their sewing ministry, and then actually being very involved in building the church and then uh, working on various uh, projects throughout the community, which has always been very exciting, different people's homes who have attended the church and needed, needed help. Very, very poor. You're going to see the poorest of poor there. And just over the hill, you're going to see Mennonite camps in, in lavish uh, houses, very big houses. They're very in, industrious and they're very good business people. The Mennonites who are there, and they're a, a significant part of the over, uh, the broader part of the community. And then most recently, as you all know, uh, we had the opportunity when uh, Pastor Jason, who had been our worship leader and our youth pastor for uh, about eight years, he, he and his wife, um, uh, Jackie and uh, Ayantu, uh, their little uh, daughter adopted our, our, our granddaughter from Ethiopia, they would go there on vacation. Now, let me just tell you, Bashiniva isn't, you're not going to find it in the tourist books 
uh, at the tour companies. Uh, although once you go, you want to keep going back because it is, it's very relaxing uh, and it just a, a great place. So they would go on their vacation and he came back one summer. I think it was two summers ago. Is that right? Came back two summers ago and just a little bit nervous. And he says, Dad, I, I think the Lord's calling Jackie and I to go to Mexico and start an orphanage. And uh, we, we were excited about the prospect and the Lord. Uh, it started this this process of the Lord uh, enabling us to come alongside uh, a number of people and to really rally behind uh, uh, what he felt the Lord was telling him to do, build an orphanage, a 7,000 square foot facility on 37 acres of land. And what a blessing it is to know that the Lord uh, used our church to play a significant role in sending Jason, Jackie, and Ayantu out. And what a blessing it is uh, to know that, that we've been able, as a, as a small church, and it's not like we have unlimited funds in the bank, but we've been able to invest over $100,000 in that, in that facility. And, and it has been just a tremendous gift to us to be able to do that. It is a very humbling experience as it's been expressed. Uh, as uh, others shared, we celebrated the 10-year anniversary there. There was the team from Sunlit Hills who were in instrumental in helping them move and laying the foundation uh, of the church when it first got started. I had not met uh, uh, Pastor Pete, but I'd heard about him. He'd heard about me, and so it was a very sweet uh, reunion, even though we hadn't met one another, and just uh, learning uh, about one another's churches and ministries, and there was just an instant connection between the teams. And of course, you always have that when you, uh, when you're the body of Christ. If you, you, we've all experienced that situation where you're in an airport and you're talking to somebody next to you, and you find out that they're a believer, and and it's like you've always known them, and that's what God intended it to be. I was so grateful that I was the third person to share, uh, because I was so overwhelmed with her emotion just seeing. Uh, uh, my son leading worship and my sister uh, up there and just realizing and just beholding what uh, Jesus can do to transform a heart and a soul and motivate them uh, to do a work. I was grateful I didn't have to share. I would, I would have literally, I would have just blubbered like a baby. I mean, I was, I, was, I was so moved emotionally, just amazed at what God had done and uh, the joy and the privilege uh, that he had given us uh, to be a part of it. As I was sitting there, as I was listening to the testimony of what God had done, Psalm 27 came to my mind. I'm just going to highlight a couple of verses, so if you don't have your Bible, uh, a Bible with you, you can just look on the person next to you or just listen carefully. It's a Psalm of David, and if there was anyone who understood all of the, uh, just the, the extremes of, of joy and elation of worship to great, tremendous despair of life. It was David, and he writes this in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, and then verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. You know, um, uh, Erasmo, we got from the, the oldest uh, child, we got from a... Uh, uh, the, the mountains in, uh, from a small uh, hundred family, Tarahumara village. Um, he has, he has uh, grandparents and he has family. And then um, uh, Jorge and Sandra, uh, just a miraculous story how we ended up acquiring those two and caring for them. They have a mother that comes and visits them. And, but little Luis, little Luis, the one that wakes you up in the morning by just smacking you upside the head. I mean, literally, he, he comes bobbing in, and uh, I think it was Erasmo or Sandra was eating their breakfast, and he just comes in and just, bam, just smacks him right up the side of the head. He says probably 100 to 150 times a day, onto, 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 onto. I mean, that, it, 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 
it's just amazing to just kind of hear, hear the kid. He loves the guitar. I had the opportunity to play the guitar with him. We were playing, and he just plays it, and he's got, he's got great rhythm. He, he loves some of the interactive games that are, that are on the iPad that just entertains him for hours and hours. And, and he's been this, I believe they said, is his fifth orphanage. His fifth orphanage. And the previous four orphanages have not been able to handle him. And they've really not known what to do with him. So not only are we impacting a community, but we're impacting uh, a, an entire state. As people from, from the, the major city of Chihuahua are coming in, and they, what are you doing? What are you doing? And you know what we're doing? We're just loving him. I mean, when you just see uh, Pastor Jason, uh, just take that little boy in his arms and just kiss on him and just love him and just hold him and just give him something that he's never had before, it, it, it is overwhelming. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. And here's the reality. A lot of times the Lord takes care of people through you and through me. Uh, not only in Mexico, but right here within our own church, within our own uh, community. And then this is what really stood out to me, verse 13. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, this sign, uh, Bienvenidos, Bashiniva, uh, los recibe con los brazos abiertos. Uh, that uh, is an interesting sign. Bienvenidos means uh, welcome to Bashiniva, and in essence, uh, los recibe con los brazos abiertos basically means um, uh, we, we welcome you with open hands. We receive you, recibes, we, 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 we receive you uh, with open hands. And the reality is that there's much darkness there. The, the town is, is run uh, by, a, uh, by uh, a local drug lord. I, uh, they're very aware of what we're doing. Remember, Pastor Jason shared uh, when he first got there, they let him uh, know that uh, Ochenta, who is the, the drug lord there, says they know who you are. And that was, uh, that was kind of Pastor Jason's welcome uh, to the community. Um, they, in a funny sort of way, they have an interest in what God is doing there. On one hand, there's tremendous corruption, but, but there's, a, there's an interest and a care for the children in, in kind of a, a twisted sort of way. And we're seeing opportunity for the Lord to, uh, to really move and, and, and to work in a powerful way. And, and we're believing, we pray for the drug lords there. They need Jesus. It's just like we needed Jesus and, and, and received him. I remember one of, the, one of the big things that I think many of you who haven't gone probably say, well, is it safe? Uh, well, uh, when you statistically look, there are more people shot in our own area uh, than there are in Mexico. Now, I'm not talking about the, the, the killings in Juarez and that sort of thing that are, that are directly drug-related, but uh, I have family members that are convinced I'll one day be killed in Mexico. And they're probably not going to go to Mexico for that reason. Uh, I, I remember a couple of a years ago when the Lord, I had to press through the fear of going there. Uh, I was struck just at the, to the very core with a fear. We had a couple of little incidences. They weren't major or anything. But, they, but there, there is a presence. In fact, Liz had, had commented a couple times just it, I think it was you that had said it's just kind of hard to get used to just seeing the, the uh, automatic weapons that, that soldiers and, and, and the like are, are carrying in Mexico. And I remember this, this sense, this tremendous sense of I'm going to be killed when I go to Mexico this time. And, and it was overwhelming. And I was praying one morning, pressing through that, and I, 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 and I felt like I heard a voice. I know I heard a voice. And, and, and the voice basically said, you're going to take, because we were getting ready to take a team there, and he said, you're going to take a team of people there, and you're going to lead them to their death, and it's going to be your fault. And I finally shared it with my wife, and she said, well, the Lord did tell you to go, didn't he? 
And so I thought, oh great, now I got to re rethink, did the Lord really tell me to go? Because now these people are going to be killed and it's going to be my fault. I couldn't make the distinction. You know, the Bible says that, the, that Satan is able to disguise himself as an angel of light. And so I couldn't make a distinction whether it was the Lord or whether it was the enemy. I had to press through it. And finally I decided, okay, I'm going. And if you want us to be killed in Mexico, then may it be for your, for your glory. Of course, I didn't tell the team that that, that was happening. I, I knew that that would significantly reduce the attendance. So I went there and, you know, este es el día, did the whole thing while inside. I'm just kind of counting the days. And on our way back, there was a sense of relief. And I shared with the team, and I'll never forget, I think it was Pam Sorelli said, why didn't you tell us this? And I said, because you probably wouldn't have come. And that was the, it was like I had to press through that oppression, that fear. And you got to press through. The enemy will try to convince you, even through well-meaning. I mean, we're, we're reading through Job right now. Job's friends who are trying to instruct him and in why all these things are happening. Listen, sometimes difficulties and trials and challenges come as a result of God wanting to mold and to shape our characters. This last time I went, it was, it was like no big, I, I, I don't even think I gave a second thought, really. It's, it, we go walking every morning, it's just, there's just not that concern. So if, if you're feeling a bit burdened by a fear, Take heart. I would have lost heart if I had not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I, I, I just, I so appreciate Jenny sharing. The church and the orphanage are a beacon of light in that place. Alcoholism is rampant. Drugs, they take the young boys and they get them involved in the, in the drugs that are there. And, and uh, uh, not unusual for older men to, to take young, young girls up to the, uh, to the hills and, and fornicate and bring them back. And that's what they call a, a Mexican wedding in that, in that culture. And so we have the opportunity to, uh, to be a beacon of light. I, I, I want to keep that picture. A beacon of light through the church there, through prayer, through financial support, through, uh, through visits that are there. You cannot uh, believe what it means to them that we come. What it means. I, I, was, I was rejuvenated. And, and, and let me just say this. We're talking about uh, Mexico right now, but we could just as easily talk about what God, how God is using our, our little church in India and, and in Europe and in Croatia and in all, all areas as we've been praying the last four years to help us to reach outside these four walls. So we're talking about what God is doing in Mexico, and he really re renewed my spirit, and there was so much joy in just discovering what God is doing and reminding me that, uh, that, that, that we must continue to be mindful of what is going on there. And I, I want to thank you for being a church that, that frees us up financially to be able to go, and for those of you who have participated in those trips. And I thank you. Uh, for allowing me to go. Uh, I'm going to be leading another trip here in just about three and a half, uh, uh, well, I guess about four weeks, four and a half weeks or so, somewhere ar around there. And it's because uh, our high school pastor, uh, Charles Gillespie, wasn't able to take the team uh, this year, uh, nor was our uh, student ministries pastor, Jason Murdoch. And so um, I really believe that the Lord... Uh, wanted me to go and I, I just want to thank you uh, and I want to thank the support team back here when when I when I leave it's just a reminder that that this church does not revolve around any personality it, it revolves around what the Lord is doing in our midst and I so appreciate your prayers while I'm gone and I appreciate the warm welcome home that I receive whenever uh, I come back. So if you want to be involved in that trip I'm going to talk about it here in just a, a, a moment then uh, be sure to, to come and, uh, because there's still some time. We're having a meeting, an informational meeting today at 1230, and I can give you a little bit more information. That'll actually be the last opportunity you'll have to be involved in that. If I were to summarize what the Lord is saying to us today, it would be with this. 
there's much work to be done. There's much work to be done. I love, uh, I love that song by Chris Tomlin. You're the God of this city. You're the king of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. And I cry every time I hear them singing this because they've changed the words a little bit. Just the last couple of, of words. And, and the chorus says, For greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in Mexico. And when I hear them sing Mexico, I go, and you hear them, man, they are singing their hearts out. Kids are singing, they're worshiping the Lord. And they say, greater things still to be done in Mexico. And then the next line, greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in Bashiniva. And uh, it moves me every time. And the Lord has given us an opportunity to be a part. When you hear the passion and you see the work that is being done, it changes you. It changes you. It changes your thinking about things. Now, here's, here's um, kind of one of the, one of the risks that, we, that, that can come from what God has allowed us to do. And I, want to incur- and I share this with you, with you to be able to pray. The Lord has raised up two separate works there that are intricately connected uh, to one another. And uh, he raised them up eight years uh, apart. And they are, they are beautifully working together. Uh, but what we need to pray for is that the Lord will keep it ever present in our own minds and hearts that God is doing a work in Mexico. He's doing a work in Mexico through a vibrant church and through a growing, vibrant orphanage or children's home. He's doing a work in Mexico, and he's giving us an opportunity to come alongside of both of these uh, two who are working intensely together, and, uh, and so we're going to be communicating with you a little bit more of what that's going to look like. But right now, let me just say, uh, just pray for those teams uh, that go out. I, w- I want to encourage and pray about your, your opportunity, an opportunity that you may have to go out. There are a couple of things uh, that I want us to be mindful of, of what God is doing as it relates to both the Uh, the church and the orphanage and the overall work in Mexico and then I'll close this next trip that we're going to be taking out uh, taking is um, uh, we're going to be studying through the book of Titus and we're going to be zeroing in on Titus 2 1 through 8 where it speaks of the older men investing in the younger men and the older women investing in the younger women and I realized when I was there I was just renewed in my understanding of one of the reasons that this uh, that it, it works so well is because of uh, this area of discipleship. So let's look at this next, uh, and I'll just briefly. Oh, I'm doing it right. Forgot. Sorry, had Jude a little nervous there. Okay, now this was actually taken a couple of years ago, and this is uh, uh, Pelon or uh, Carlos. This is uh, Haido. Haido was, was on that first trip, and I think he was six years old or something when we, he, he's, a, he's a, a great young man. He's, um, uh, P- Pelon is now working for the orphanage. He's about to get married here in three months or something like that. In, um, and then Haido just graduated from college. He was working, making a good living with the Mennonites, and he uh, it just left that job and we've hired him uh, at the orphanage to take care he's great with kids but also to take care of some of the administrative paperwork that has to be done uh, in Mexico and uh, we've known him for a long long time very solid in the church just a solid solid young man you oops do you uh, do you recognize this young, this young man right here how many of you recognize him that's Aaron Weens Aaron he's a little bit of a free spirit uh, he'd jump on his motorcycle, go to Peru, Peru and uh, uh, get a little encephalitis and end up uh, almost dying. And now he's actually uh, fell in love with a, uh, he's self-taught Spanish. And then he fell in love with this young lady right here, Yohaida. And they recently got married. And now he is pastoring a church in some remote mountains 
uh, this, of this Tarahumara village, and he pastors the church there. And so it was really great because his parents, uh, his parents came and visited while we were there. This is his dad, his mom, his brother, uh, his wife, and his sister. And this young boy is from the village in the mountains. He brought him down. So I want you to catch this picture of just discipleship, just taking the younger, the older investing in the younger. And we're starting to see that in a profound way in our church. And I'm not just talking about what God is doing in our youth ministry, which is very exciting. But what he's doing is he's raising up just certain people in our church who aren't necessarily active actively involved in youth ministry and they're just pouring into young people's lives and that's a biblical uh, that's a biblical approach to youth ministry that is just being involved in their lives and so he brings this young man uh, down with him and their family went up to the hills we didn't get a chance to go up and see the work that he's doing up there but uh, be praying for uh, Aaron and his wife Yehida there she is uh, there, I could tell you a funny story. Watch your back when you're with this one right here if you go, or you'll end up with animal crackers stuffed in your clothes. You just have to uh, be mindful of that. This is Sarah. Let me just, uh, Sandra, Sandra. This is, uh, I mean, just the sweetest, sweetest little girl. Uh, Liz started a coloring ministry with her in uh, Bashinaba. I had no idea Liz was that gifted in coloring, but we saw that. I, I completely underestimated the impact these kids would have on my life. I mean, I knew we'd go, we'd see them, we'd play with them, but you fall in love with them. I mean, you just fall in love with them. And uh, you, you, you know, they're hugging you, they're, they're, they're loving on you, you're loving on them. This is uh, Pastor Jason. This is Luis here, and this is Erasmo. And... Uh, it's, it's just so great just eating breakfast with them and uh, uh, hanging out with them, playing the guitar with them, singing with them, joking with them. Uh, this is Erasmo. I bought some of the, we, uh, Jenny and I bought some of those giant marshmallows. They're, they're about, like, they're huge. And I, I, you can't even play Chubby Bunny. It's like Chubby Marshmallow 1. It's all you can. I decided to be funny and throw one into my mouth, and I thought I was going to choke to death. And then he did... He did the same thing. This is Jorge. Jorge is not in as many pictures because this is his, uh, uh, Sandra's older brother. And he's not in as many pictures because he goes to school. And the other, the other uh, boys, um, uh, Sandra, did she go to school as well? No, she did. Oh, that's right, she did. Uh, but the other two didn't get in yet, but, but they'll be in next year. And here's the thing I learned about Mexico that that this orphanage has opened our eyes to and that's involvement in the community and I would have lost heart if I had not seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living there's a lot of people that Luis is going to be able to go to a, a school where his special needs will be addressed in Mexico and how many of us I'm at the top of the list that have been so ignorant to to think well I'm we'll come as the Americans and show them a thing or two and what the Lord has given us this opportunity is to get a, a front row seat into a community that you, we wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to see otherwise. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Glenn Myron's brother. Ayantu, we got to walk Ayantu to school. Ayantu would pray for many of the meals in Spanish. Her Spanish is amazing, that, that little girl. And we got to... Uh, take her on the on the last day. Here's here's a Yantu, and these are little school friends, and this is her teacher. That's the other thing. You know, how many times do you get an opportunity to go on a missions trip and actually be able to go into the school and to meet uh, the teachers and to meet the kids? Uh, look at her three, her two little friends. They are just beautiful, beautiful uh, little kids. The other thing the Lord has opened up the door of opportunity is to impact the Mennonite community. This is a, a Mennonite school. They mentioned Ser Hill, where we went and prayed at Coro Viva or Coro, Coro Riva or something like that. Is it, oh, oh, that's right, that's right. I'm sorry. I think that's where um, Aaron is. Uh, Port Venir is a little town where we went, where Myron mentioned we went to pray. And uh, Josefina is Sergio's wife. And she's a teacher at the Mennonite school. 
And so uh, the Mennonites, they say the Mennonites never come over the hill. That means from the compos, the Mennonite compos, over, over this hill into Bashiniva, they never come over the hill. But the Lord, uh, having other things in mind, brought this whole Mennonite class into, um, into Bashiniva to the orphanage uh, where uh, they would get a tour of the orphanage. They ate, they did a little I think project and, and ate a snack and played some games outside and they're just overwhelmed at, at the opportunity that they had uh, to do that. And then finally, uh, I'll leave you, uh, well, that's an example of, of uh, impacting a community. Let me, let me mention one other thing that you can be in prayer for uh, that, that tells you just kind of how the Lord is, is using uh, our church to be able to impact a country um, Jason's been invited to um, go to Utah to an organization that ad adopts kids, and they just got uh, approval to be able to adopt kids uh, out of Mexico, which is, which is no small deal. And they want to talk to him to see about getting connected with, uh, with what, what's happening at, at the orphanage. So please be in prayer uh, for that. That's going to be a significant uh, uh, opportunity that we may have. And he's very excited. He, remember when we hosted the, uh, the children from Ukraine and we're still getting, I just heard, I think uh, Yulia is coming back. Is that right? So we're, that's, we're still experiencing the blessings of that. Uh, but uh, Pastor Jason really has a heart to, to, uh, to um, provide an opportunity. He said, wouldn't it be awesome if we were able to host the kids from our orphanage uh, here in our church. And that would just be spectacular if that happens. So please be in prayer for that. But I want to close with this story here. This is, um, this is Jason Nieves, uh, my nephew. He was six on that first, uh, on that first uh, trip back in 1996. This kid, or man, young man, is one of the hardest workers uh, I've ever seen. All he did was drink pop and eat chips on that first trip when he was uh, uh, six years old. This is Rigo, and I found out that, uh, I thought he looked familiar, but he's the pharmacist. Remember when, uh, he's the pharmacist, and he owns some bean fields and shares water rights with, uh, with the orphanage. And so this is, this is Carlos, and so, when the water tank runs low, you have to go up and you have to switch the switch to divert the water from the irrigating, the bean, Rigo's bean fields, and to fill up the, the water tank. Well, the, where the, the pump is, there's a big transformer, and people steal those transformers. Uh, I mean, you better know something about electricity if you're going to steal a transformer. So, so... Rigo had gotten permission from the uh, police that if anybody's tampering, he can shoot him. So uh, Pelon, Carlos, he takes his brother to go and to switch the water, and Rigo shows up to shoot him with guns pointed, ready to kill him. Well, needless to say, Pelon comes back, he's a little nervous. He is visibly shaken over what's happened. And this is just how awesome God is. If the Lord wanted Pelon to be shot, he would allow him to be shot. But that's not what he had in mind. What he had in mind is being able to get water whenever we needed water through Rigo. Rigo feels so horrible that he almost shoots Pelon that he apologizes over and over and over uh, to Jason, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he, he's still apologizing. He says, anytime you need water, you, I don't care what we're doing, I don't care how much you're, you change that water and you fill up your tanks. So Jason and I go to do that. And Carlos, who's one of his, Rigo's laborers, he comes out because he can't, while the water's being diverted, he can't uh, do anything. So he's sitting there. We're talking in very, very bad Spanish on my part and uh, better Spanish on Jason's part. But the best we can pick up is he was attending another church. We're trying to witness to him in a language that we can. I mean, we probably, Lord only knows what we said. But 
So he shares, what we can pick up is that we think that he didn't get his questions answered at this church he was attending, and that's why he didn't go to church. And, but what we found out, I said, you gotta get Nevis over here, we gotta share the gospel with him and invite him to church. So Carlos comes over and comes to find out it wasn't that he didn't get his questions answered, it was that he didn't like the questions he was being asked at the church. And it was the most natural just gospel threads in Mexico through a translator of just sharing the gospel and why uh, we, I asked him what questions he didn't like and then I was able to address the depravity of man and talk about how Jesus is the only answer. Invited him to church, he came on the Wednesday before we left and he accepted Christ. And amen, amen. Bad Spanish and all, and Nieves. We gotta throw Nieves in there because he's... God desires to bring good cheer in the midst of difficulties and darkness. And I'm glad I was reminded uh, about those two girls. It was sad. It was sad. And I praise God for uh, Luis. He went to the police station right away. And this was another thing you wouldn't, I'd never seen it before. You think the police is nothing but corrupt, nothing but corrupt, nothing but corrupt. And they very, may, they, they, they very well may be, and, and to, to a large extent are. But here's the thing. Uh, Luis went to the police, and man, he came out of there with, with weapons, flak jacket and all, and he was going to go talk to those men about what he was, uh, what he was uh, scheming to do with those little girls. Um, we have been given an opportunity to be, as Jenny said, this beacon of light to a very, very dark area. We've been given that same opportunity to be a, be a beacon of light in, um, in the Puyallup area, in Tacoma area, in all the areas where we live. Uh, you know, I heard something so ridiculous. This should be no surprise to any of us. But I heard something on the radio, I think on, uh, on Thursday as we were, or Friday as we were getting ready to leave. I, was, I, was, I heard how the health department is trying to encourage you how to warn your kids about young people about the dangers of marijuana. <laughs> and I thought, are you kidding me? I, are you kidding me? I mean, you, you talk about the pot calling the kettle black. I, at the same time, you know, we make it legal and then we try to warn of the dangers of it. And so the reality is that, that we live in that time when, when we're just calling good, evil, evil, good, darkness for light, light for darkness. And, and we need to purpose in our hearts to be beacons of light wherever we are, wherever we are. Now, we're in these other countries because the Lord told us we're to be in other countries. We're to preach the gospel to all nations. But let me just close and pray with this. We will never be effective for Christ until we are in love with Christ. We'll never be effective for the kingdom of God until we have a heart for the kingdom of God, until we love uh, the kingdom of God. And here's the question, what will it take? What will it take? Will it take tragedy in your life? Will it take difficulty in your life? Uh, will it take death? What will it take to get uh, our attention to understanding that man at his best state, at his best state, is but a vapor? But God's, in God's economy, he wants to use that brief period of time for us to be beacons of light wherever that we may find ourselves. And that'll never happen unless how we let him be the ultimate beacon of light into our own hearts to transform us, to renew us, and to get us thinking uh, in a proper perspective about this very, very short life in which we live. Amen. Thank you so much again for your prayers and thank you for, for letting me keep you uh, a, a little bit longer. Uh, let's pray and uh, have the worship team come up and just close us out in a song. It just doesn't feel right if there isn't a little song before we, we leave. Amen? Let's stand up.